nine in the morning to nine at night, you know, all week. Between that and usually plain things. And all this crap you see on this, this is because I work for the government and they're trying to put a bunch of seed and stuff on every new graph. So pay no attention to it. I would prefer to do this and it's just great people. Okay. This <coughs> presentation began many moons ago. Yeah, many, many, many moons ago, when I first started working for the government, I had a boss that when you were working on routine problems, he'd come and pose problems to you. And the title of this talk and everything is related to that. There was an old radar that the Navy was in the process of phasing out where they actually listened to the radar when it was observing things. And they never could, they, they knew people listening to it could figure out things about what a target was doing, but they couldn't come up with an analytic expression for it. And so he challenged me to come up with an explanation for it. And that, over the years, I've written a number of papers about the non-uniform Doppler effect, which is basically what happens when, you have, when you're observing something with the sensor and it's not going in a straight line motion where you have normal Doppler but it's doing things like this and get, engaging circular motion, other types of motion. And when you think about it, when you connect sound to motion, what you're doing is what Kepler did, it was namely talking about the music of the spheres dating back to uh, 16th, 15th and 16th century. And this figure right here actually this is how he came up with the geometric picture of the motion of the planets. He looked at this for a while and then realized it had to be three-dimensional. So I thought that would, given that there are graduate students in here, history is always nice. Uh, and so, just as you can take an electric, uh, take a uh, acoustical signal and transform it into an electrical signal, or take a electromagnetic radiation and transform it into acoustic. Thing. And you can in fact hear astronomical bodies and bodies in motion when you're observing them same. So the radar synesthesia point of view is to view the transform of the return signal as an audio signal. And so you can think, when you have the audio signal, you can either think of visualizing it <coughs> or listening to it. It's also possible, though I'm not going to talk about it, to think about it transforming a signal into a form of touch, that basically three of the senses, it's possible to think about transforming signals back and forth between the different senses. And then that gives you a different way of experiencing something, so it gives you different ways to think about it. Anyway, so this not a uniform Doppler effect suggests a new approaches to representation of functions as well as a new ways of thinking about things. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit as well as the non-uniform Doppler effect. And does this also have a word? Oh, yeah. Okay. Really? Oh, no, no. Green, green we use for polarization experiments. Uh, so this is the canonical model of the Doppler effect. You have a RF source, you have something moving, but it, and, and a law of motion for it. Where for the moment, we assume you know what it is. There's an inverse problem given what you receive. Figuring out what RFP is, I'll, I'll talk about that at the end. So. So what is the Doppler effect? Well, it depends. You say it's physics. It can depend. 
Well, from the practice, from the point of view of uh, the physicist, which I am, the Doppler effect is nothing more than a double Lorentz transformation if you're talking electromagnetics, and the and also an equivalent type Gal uh, Galilean transformation if you're an acoustician. And my friend, who's a friend of mine who's an acoustician, said you might confuse people unless you mention the acoustics part as well. Engineering, he said, the, the, it's, they don't think in terms of Lorentz transformations. They just think of uh, scattering theory and interaction with receivers. So it's just a substitute RT in there and just hope for the best. And that's one of the things is, is that the engineer's approach doesn't always give you the right answer. And then if you look, and then it's a mathematician, it's actually uh, a Mobius group transformation of the, uh, linear, of the linear time element. But basically, for all practical purposes, which is a term I would use frequently, it's this, just namely, your received signal is G of T, then, then it's a dilation and translation. And for the, the wavelet people in the audience, that looks very familiar to them. The, the Doppler effect is a, it, it can be viewed as a wavelet transformation. Now, is there any rate? was an Israeli physicist named Sensor who was looking at non-uniform motion and non-uniform motion. I have bad machine karma. I was told this many years ago. Uh, notice that you, when you have non-uniform motion, namely an R of T is not equal to a uh, linear function of time. You can make this sort of transformation and require H of, H of tau equal T and you can get this functional equation. This change of variables allows you to redefine the tau, time axis starting at tau equals zero. And solving this functional equation for H of tau allows you to, uh, to accomplish this. And so for a scattered waveform with some work that are in an appendix I'm not going to talk about, you end up with this equation that G of tau is equal to A minus A of H of tau, F of 2 H of tau minus tau. Oh, and so the canonical form of the scattered wave function is this, where F of the capital F is just the integral of the little initial wave form you started with. Is that both equations, the equation on the previous page, and this one, uh, the equation you have to solve for H of tau, is in fact an interesting, come on in, sit down, don't worry about it. I'm easily interrupted. Uh, the um, functional equation for H of tau is an interesting equation that no one's, that there are a bunch of simple solutions that'd be interesting to find out whether or not you can say something general about it. For those of you that like to solve functional equations. But this is, this equation and simplification is what's interesting to, interesting to RF and other people. Now, to dot our T's and cross our I's, uh, you need to say that this is, that equation is independent of bandwidth assumptions, and it is a back expression. And it, it, the, the fact that the derivative is not noticeable on narrow band waveforms, but is noticeable on wide band waveforms, and that leads to something interesting. And it's also an exact solution that satisfies the boundary conditions of the boundary. So it's exact in the, so it's exact in the sense both in special relativity and in general relativity that this actually works. And that's because the cute trick in an appendix that I stuck <laughs> in here, for those of you, are, you that are interested, I'm not going to discuss, but the, why it works in general relativity as well. It's called a, a quasi-stationary approach. And for example, um, For a simple linear motion, h of tau is this. And so your final expression uh, for the Doppler effect is this, and this is usually an approximation. This is the wide band form. And this is, result is, the topic result is an agreement with relativity. Similarly, you can solve for h of tau for an accelerating mirror and get an exact expression. And that's what this is. 
And you can also do it with cubics and quadratics, of course. And unless something has changed, you can't do it for anything higher than that. You can, however, solve it approximately for some other interesting things, which is what I'm going to talk about. And so how do you go about solving it approximately is you assume that h of tau, you solve it assuming that h of tau is approximately like this. You go through an iterative process. They convert, and this iteration process converges into the functional form. Uh, as you go through the iteration, and it's the properties of contraction mapping, for those of you that are interested in such things, will allow you to make that argument. I won't say anything further. Okay, so the final form that I'm playing with is this one right here. And this form is sufficient for most radar, almost all radar applications. It's only when you're observing something moving extremely fast. But, this is, but if you were observing something moving extremely fast, you'd have to be making an astrophysical rather than radar observation. But this form, in, in fact, tells you some funny things happen with it. Um, you get complicated spectrum. And they're complicated. Uh, and the, another thing, when I was working on this later on, is as I told some, was telling uh, some radar engineers, uh, this is back in the early 90s, was telling something too, is that you get complicated spectrum out of the of just a Doppler effect of watching something rotating or something of turbine blades. They said, no, nah, you can't get that. I said, well, I've proven it. Said, no. So what we did was we went out and built a really simple radar. And we started doing things like rotating cylinders and stuff. And sure enough, the spectrum when you rotated the cylinder versus when it wasn't rotating. They said, who would have thought of that? <coughs> of course, any, any physicist or goods uh, electromagnetics engineer would have said, where are these guys? But radar engineers don't necessarily <coughs> aren't necessarily the same as electromagnetics in terms of understanding the details of Maxwell equation. That's something that was a surprise to me when I first started working with it. But the simplest form of waveform you can look at is this right here. It's just a sinusoidal, that's what's called an interrupted sinusoid. It's, you turn it on, let it go, and turn it off. And when you do that, and work through it, the canonical form ends up being this right here, where a law of motion R of tau. And that's for a normal Doppler. But for when R of tau is not equal to V0T, you get complicated Doppler and micro Doppler. And complicated means that when you listen to it, you're going to hear something other than a straight tone. So if I could whistle today, I would whistle something, but I can't whistle. My voice is sh too shot to be able to do this. So anyone that has a good whistling voice, Beethoven's Fifth would be nice right now as far as an example of complicated thought. But you, and, and you think about that, it would be actually interesting. What kind of law of motion would lead to Beethoven's Fifth? There's a, there's a homework problem. Are there any graduate students in the audience? <laughs> I see one smiling back there. I think we have a candidate. Uh, Non-uniform motion can be divided into two classes, periodic and non-periodic. And I'll te treat each one separately. Non-linear motion characteristics, like I said, complicated, uh, complicate the characteristics of the received signal. Uh, Greg would tell you, who is the one who, back, Greg's back there, smile. He, he's the one that had me give this talk, arranged for me to give this talk, and when I gave it the version of this last year, um, there were sound effects. He will be providing them in a minute. Okay. An additional thing you can work out of general uh, out of the Doppler effect is uh, to find the frequency spread. And what you find is is for any return signal G of now, you get higher order moments when you get when G has that R of tau term that isn't equal to, but to, uh, isn't linear. And so you get, not only do you get the spectral effects, you also get spreading of them. 
and which is interesting. Uh, besides spectral methods for analyzing Doppler, you can also use things called waterfall charts where you take a spectrum and you line one on top of another on top of another. You can do averaging. You can also do tracking of successive ones using, uh, do they teach, does anyone do, um, the, does the graduate math department here talk about column filters at all? Okay, so you can also talk about, we have a very famous, uh, well-known journal, not famous, uh, on uh, Fourier methods where figure transforms among, uh, and other things we talked about. You can also introduce a non-uniform ambiguity function uh, and also uh, general time frequency methods as discussed in Chin. And these references you see put in here, there's actually a whole list of references at the end of this presentation, so if you're interested in details, look them up, they're there. Simplest uh, interesting non-uniform example is for an accelerating mirror. And you can solve this and get the solution as a Fresnel interval. And the interesting thing about this is this term right here. You don't get one specific, uh, <coughs> you, get to, you, get, you get these two terms. One at the acceleration minus a shifting term is proportional to the uh, acceleration and the, and the wavelength in this one. And the thing is, is I was, um, so what happens is, is normally these two peaks are right on top of each other. So you don't know that they're two peaks. But um, if the acceleration is high enough, and high enough is, uh, you can uh, look up, I've got it in one of my papers, what high enough is, is they start to spread out. And I explained this to someone one day, and he says, that explains something. We've been getting false alarms thinking that you have two of our targets when if you actually work out the mathematics, there's only one. It's just this, you're, you're moving fast, you're, you're accelerating fast enough that you get the appearance of two objects. This is sort of what, what, a, water, what, a, what a waterfall chart looks at. If you have an acceleration in successive time interval, it moves this way. <coughs> for, for a jerk model, it's uh, this. And so, uh, where the, where the, 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 the um, functions are area functions. So this is a special function delight working out different models. So if you love special functions, you'll find also that depending on what you do, you get to go and play around with them a lot yeah, in terms of this. There's also an interesting connection between this and the um, a, a bouncing ball and twine mechanics that is, I'll skip. Uh, we can also talk about accelerating models where you have essentially something coming, ex exponential slowdown. Two minutes, okay. Oops, I'm, I did just, do it. so let's skip that. And you can also talk about periodic models and you can, when you work it out, you can figure out an analytic expression for that. And here's what it is. And you get a spectrum where you get the central peaks and the side bands. And these are the singing side bands. These are the things that when you, something is vibrating, or undergoing uh, circular motion, you get these. And then you have different types, of multiple different types of motion. You get uh, uh, additional, multiple superpositions of these. And you can work this out for any sort of periodic motion, and this is what the expression is in general. And they're basically, um, vibrations and uh, periodic motion create side bands. Um, you can also get it from chopping motion where uh, you have something going around like this and that chops the electromagnetic waves and produces periodicity in it. And you know, rotating cylinders and spheres also produce it. Um, there are a number of different applications. Uh, these Classification means trying to figure out what's causing it. Kill assessment, which is actually what started it, my interest. Biomedical, which is basically trying to figure out what the sounds, of, the motion of the body is, and trying to see what the, do the Doppler is telling you about it. Non-destructive testing and model reconstruction. 
Uh, you can also use it to define new types of time frequency distributions based on this law of motion. Uh, and then one other thing is, is what is the law, given something, what is the underlying law of motion that causes it? What is the law of motion R of T that causes it? So what you're trying to do is essentially do an inverse wavelet transform. And so that's it. Uh, basically, you can do these sort of modulation transforms and other types. And there are all sorts of interesting mathematical things you can do for looking in terms of trying to figure out what R of tau is, given your, a data stream. And you can solve inverse problems. And that's basically it. So, I apologize, like I said, I apologize for my voice. It's not very dynamic as I usually am. So lots of interesting things that you can play with. There's lots of math as well as physics problems underlying all of this. And this sort of gives you a simple overview of it. It allows you to give you the suggestive thing. Thank you. Time for questions? Uh, by the way, these uh, talks, uh, unless someone doesn't want them, are all being videotaped. So uh, you can, uh, and, all, and, and then you can see them on our Mountain Wing Center website uh, when, when they put them up. There's obviously a code problem, uh, and we will try to rectify that sometime this morning. Are you going to post the actual presentation to? Uh, I, I, well, I why don't we discuss that? that uh, okay. Uh, so you have an example of successful implementation of inverse, solving inverse problem. <coughs> you something and then you predict yeah, it. Yeah. Um, and that's in one of the papers that I worked Yes, sir. To actually follow, I guess, exactly the same. <coughs> so in, in radar, some people use, uh, I mean, when you use the uh, pulse-based radar, you measure ranges at different moments in time from where you estimate the velocity. Yes. Right? And my question is, compared to this method, I mean, you know, estimating the motion based on, you know, successive measurements of the range. How accurate or how do you, how do you feel the, uh, you know, estimating simultaneously position as well as velocity from the radar return is? It depends on the radar. It depends on the specifics of the radar. Some types of radar, it's going to work much better and some it's not going to work at all. You'd have to have, a be talking about a specific waveform in order to do it side-by-side uh, -side comparison. And, and, uh, this, it's, it's, excuse me, for those of you that are not familiar with this, is uh, what I call the, essentially F of T is what's called, uh, that I mentioned at the beginning, is the, is the waveform. And that depending on what you're doing and uh, who, who's paying for the radar, that F of T can either be very simple or very complicated. And for instance, the weather radar F of T can be um, can be moderately complicated, say, to a, compared to a military radar, but not as complicated as a very classified military radar. So it really depends on what you're trying to do with it. You might have day-to-day -day applications where you're just doing what the FAA does, but on those certain given days, you want detailed that I can't discuss where you be able to, you know, switch to different, to different types of ways. Let's leave it at that. This seems like a good topic for coffee. <laughs> Thank you very much for a great time.